All right, so I am going to go through a few slides and then I am also going to be uh, talking a bit later about medication and that's gonna be mostly what's on your mind about medication. This one, um, I'm gonna highlight some things that we've learned in our work over the last 10 years. And I trained, I, I think my introduction, I said I was a psychiatrist, I'm in the Department of Psychiatry. I do several things at Stanford. I have a really charmed life as an academic, I have to say. I'm surrounded by amazing, brilliant women, people of color, people with lots of experience who are professor emeriti and clinical instructors and assistant and associate professors, people I've trained, a lot of people in the community, a lot of parents who we learned a lot from because in Northern California, we have lost young people to suicide. So as we go through this, um, it's very, very important that you are just keeping track of your own emotions. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about things that are um, specific and in detail around what happens in suicide because I think I'm with an audience of people who understand what it is. But I'm gonna share some lessons that people that I've done research with in our program and in the community and people who've been thinking about this in schools, um, what we've learned in the last 10 years over some losses that we've had and maybe some wisdom for the next 10. And we don't do this work alone. This is really important. This is Stanford campus here. And um, some of you may be aware, but we, we actually lost a graduate student this, this Sunday. And um, a really important piece of how this was announced is in accordance with the guidelines for reporting on suicide, and you'll get my slides and there is a reference in there, the media has come up with their own set of regulations based on best practice, based on the science of how do you tell the story when something tragic has happened without sensationalizing? How do we respect the person who we've lost while not focusing on their death, while not focusing on the method, while not showing a picture of the place where they took their life, while using respectful language? And so there are agreed upon guidelines. There is an evidence base that is forming about what are the right things and wrong things to do based on over 50 years of research and most recently, one of our students came up with a tool which was published in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, which is free, and I have the link in my slides. And she came up with a tool called Tempos, which is the tool for evaluating media portrayals of suicide. So when we lost this student, his name was Jonathan San Miguel. He was a graduate student in physics. Um, the first thing was the the, the editors of the school paper reached out to our group because they wanted to make sure they got the story right. So coming back to where we started with Dr. Brackett and with our panel, it's all about the relationship. And when I started this work, we used to think the media was the enemy because they always get the story sensationalized, they run a headline, they are trying to get clicks and bring people in. And that's actually true to an extent, but when you talk to individual reporters, and you develop a relationship, actually, you have a lot of influence. And we've seen that happen. And the data show that when the media get it right and tell the story responsibly with a lot of resources, you can save lives. The media has a role in saving lives. And if they don't do that, they can be part of the problem when we have something called the suicide cluster. So in my community of Palo Alto, we have had two suicide clusters in the community, and at Stanford University, we are in the middle of a cluster right now. And so I'm coming to you with some lived experience there, and my wife and I have raised, uh, we have two teenagers now and one college student. So those of you who are in school, part of school, or students, you may know that two to three percent of students will make a serious suicide attempt annually, and in a school of 2,000, this is about 40 to 60 students a year. So when I show this slide to school boards and 
administrators, you know, and they think, okay, let's see, how many 5150s do we have this? Oh, only 20. We're doing pretty good. <laughs> uh, so the idea is these are national numbers that are true for California. And you are not going to know as a school administrator who ended up in the emergency room or not. Thankfully, suicide is rare, but when it happens, it has a lot of ripple effects. And so after a cluster, or after someone dies, everyone gets together. There's a lot of work in the administration to put in programs. And then unfortunately, they just want it to go away. They want it to stop. They want to stop talking about it. So here's a question. Does talking about suicide in a community that's never experienced suicide, does giving a talk about it or teaching about it in school, in the context of first talking about well-being and the components of well-being, and stress and how stress is actually adaptive and good for us as humans, but too much stress is not good and a lot of stress is bad. And then we also talk about suicide and suicide prevention. So if we do that, are we putting the idea of suicide in the heads of our students and are we increasing the risk? Okay, I'm with an audience, we're singing to the choir. There's actually been a lot of research on this. So the answer is no with an asterisk. It depends on how you talk about it. And so when we had this loss on Sunday, the journalists reached out to us because they want to get the messaging right. They want us to be able to talk about these reactions we're having, the grief, and also we want young people to reach out way before there's a crisis. So that means you have to have things like well-being coaching, and you have to infuse the schools with counselors with some skills. There was a nurse asked a question from the panel, like, should we get CBT training? Yes, there are, there are actually papers written for CBT for nursing and primary care personnel to use CBT principles. So you're not doing 12 sessions of therapy, but you are thinking about the paradigms around how we think can affect the way we feel, which affects the way we behave. Absolutely. Um, so the point here is it's rare, but suicidal thinking is common. So we have to stay on top of it. And a lot of the programs that are out there now are helping community members to think about how do I ask questions of people that I might be concerned about? How do I open the door to a conversation? So as we think about in the, in the research world, as we think about how do we do prevention, it's hard to measure the effects of prevention. If we're not having any more suicides in our community, that does not mean that our interventions have worked. We have to measure other things. So we want to make sure that we are also, as we are trying to prevent suicide, we are also promoting well-being. And those principles that Dr. Brackett talked about are a very important part of suicide prevention. In fact, one of the most robust programs developed for suicide prevention is implemented in second and third grade. It's called the Good Behavior Game. Anybody know about the Good Behavior Game? So you look up the um, PAX, P-A-X, Good Behavior Game, um, you will see, you will read about the evidence and what it is, and it helps teachers to do what they're already doing, but it's a very intentional kind of program, and over time you can track these kids actually have a much lower risk of suicide because of the social emotional learning skills that are introduced early and visited often. By the way, everyone, please, if you haven't already, download How We Feel. It's an unbelievable tool, and it's free, and it will help you. And you can do it during the break. You can tap right into it. You can register your emotion. You can start to practice with it. It's wonderful. So that's what we're doing right now. If you look at um, A over here, education and awareness. This is what I'm doing right now with you all. And in schools, we might be screening for individuals at high risk, and we'll talk about treatment in other talks throughout the day. On the left side, this is kind of a broad picture of what happens. Stressful life event, we all deal with stressful life events, but if it's in the context of a mood or other psychiatric condition, we might have a person start thinking about, maybe this is gonna to be too hard for me to live my life, suicidal ideation. So 16 to 18% of American young people, 15 to 24, have thought about suicide in the last year. This is not uncommon, but it's rare for someone to attempt 
um, or end up taking their lives. So this is where we get involved. We think about, well, the factors are having to do with brain development, and young people develop brains into their early 20s, so there's, a, there's this concept of impulsivity. Something stressful happens and a person you know, goes to the train tracks. Well, that's actually not what happens. There's a context. There is rarely a simple answer, but yes, the interpersonal stressors can be the proverbial straw that feels like it's breaking my back. What we learn about in, in treatment is there's a time frame with young people where something really stressful happens, it feels like too much, and there's a period of about eight to 20 minutes, which is the critical period. If you can teach about these skills and teach about breathing and mindfulness and taking some time away and connecting with a friend and developing a safety plan with what you're gonna do when you get in these moments, that can be life-saving. So that period of time between roughly eight and 20 minutes, the impulsivity, that's what we have to deal with, especially with young people. Combined with things like hopelessness and importantly, access to lethal means. So this is another part of what we do in prevention when we talk about locking up the medicines and the sharp objects um, and then imitation. I talked a little bit about this because of the role of the media, but I wanna move to protective factors and focus on that because you're gonna hear a lot today about the different things that are helpful. I think you have a pretty good sense of risk factors and I don't think we have to spend too much time in a big plenary like this talking about risks. But what the research shows is that there are a few things that many of you are already aware of, and it's nice when there's research to show it. There's actually 30 to 40 years of research showing things like family connectedness and really important parent-child or caregiver-child relationships with the just right amount of parental involvement and something I like to call cultural value congruence where in some schools like where we live in Santa Clara County, in the high school where my kids go, if you have an audience of parents and you ask how many of you went to high school somewhere other than the US, three quarters of the room's hands go up. So right there you're dealing with some potential cultural opportunity because you have a richness and diversity in your school climate and community. You also have the opportunity for incongruence where the teens are thinking one thing about wanting to be with their friends and always on their phone and because that's what we do here and the, and the parents are like clueless and don't understand like how do I raise this, this teenager because I, I don't speak the same language as young people. I don't understand how to do what I had now everything that was not great when I was growing up, but there were certain things we didn't have. Well, we didn't have a smartphone. So how many of you are getting ready for prom or are getting ready to ask someone for prom or did it recently, okay? So when I was younger and Dr. Piacentini and uh, Dr. Brackett, Dr. Kramer, Dr. Friedman, like if we wanted to ask someone to prom, there was one phone <laughs> attached to a wall, probably in the kitchen. And when I picked up the phone, because I wanted to ask Marianne Lundeen to go to the prom with me, and her father was Mr. Lundeen, the principal. I, I had, okay, so in that, I had to learn social skills very fast. We did not have a how to feel curriculum. Dr. Brackett was just a kid back then. Unfortunately, we didn't have that. So no one ever taught me. I just had to learn it on the fly. How do I have a conversation with an adult to ask permission to speak to his daughter? Because he probably knows, just like the whole world knows, I'm going to ask her to the prom. So I asked my parents. My parents didn't really know, but um, I, I had to ask their permission, right, if I could go to the prom. And this is not the reality. So of today, we need to really help parents and teens talk with each other. And there's some interesting work going on at Stanford around this specifically, around trying to bridge parents and youth, and especially where there are diverse cultures. The next one on the bottom is um, religiousness. Religion, organized religion, in many cases can be very helpful if you're part of a community of people, especially if it's a religious tradition that is specifically, um, really has a lot of taboo against suicide. In fact, 
raising the taboo against suicide, taking it off the table, is one of the outcomes we follow in some of the tier one interventions like sources of strength and youth aware of mental health. Um, but even spirituality, 70 to 80% of Bay Area youth endorse some kind of spiritual life. It may or may not be religious, it's often not. It may be a secular spirituality, but the idea that you're connected to something bigger than yourself, that's an important thing to tap into because you'll see when I put an example of the safety plan, what are your reasons to go on living for? That is the last question you ask in a safety plan because that's the thing you want to leave them with. Some people will talk about a cause they're connected to or a group of people or something they want to do in their life, which is a reason to go on living for. Physical activity, very important. You're going to hear more about that today. Going up to the right, positive school connections, school climate, another really key piece. Pro-social peer connections and the perceived availability of trusted adults. This is also on the college campus. On this campus, in this school, adults care about kids. What are the percentages? How do we track that? How do we help our teachers and staff open the door to conversations so that the students in the class feel like, okay, I can't talk to my parents about this, but I feel like I can talk to Mr. Stewart because he's like a cool guy and I always see people go into his room and just chill and have lunch and they don't have to say anything, they just go to his room and it's cool, I wanna try that. So that's on us, that's on us as the researchers, as the people in the um, like civic and university leadership to engage with the community, say here are some things you can do to open the door to a conversation before there's a crisis. So this is around Availability of trusted adults and the youth perception that yes, they are actually there, I can go, I can knock on their door, and oh, by the way, yeah, teachers wanna show up for their students, but they're not gonna go looking for those students. But if they see something worrisome in the classroom or something they overhear in a conversation or something that's written in an essay, we have to provide the tools to allow them to have those conversations. And Lori, early on, mentioned youth mental health first aid, which is a very important um, training to get. It is rather long. It's eight hours in person, but it's worth every minute. Um, there's a program called Cognito with a K, K-O-G-N-I-T-O. I have the reference in my slides. Um, and things like this, which are in, intended to help us as adults open the door to a conversation and then know what to do if there is some concern on our part. How do we connect them to help? And then finally, a sense of belonging and connectedness. So opportunities to engage in supportive social environments, which maybe we took for granted before COVID, before March 2020. But for the theater kids in the room, for the baseball kids, for other people in other clubs, um, you can't do a lot of this on Zoom. You can do some of it. You can actually do a lot of AIM activities. Youth ambassadors can connect on Zoom, as I know they have from throughout the Bay Area. Kudos to you all. But being connected can be virtual and very meaningful, and it actually got our boys through the pandemic. We, we, we used to have the rule, you know, no video games past uh, whatever, at a certain time on the weekends and no video games during the week. We had to let that version of normal go after March 2020 because this was the lifeline. They stayed connected. So connections are a very important piece, not only of well-being, but also in suicide prevention. And it's the loss of connection and the two concepts that are not on this slide specifically, but the idea that if you have a sense of belonging and it's interrupted or it's thwarted, there's a concept called thwarted belonging or thwarted belongingness. And it's something that's measured and followed in something called the interpersonal theory of suicide. And in this theory, this is Dr. Tom Joyner's work from Florida, that the idea is that if you have that connection, it can be very protective, but if, if and, and lead to a sense of belonging. I not only fit in, but I can be who I am and be exactly where I, I am, exactly where I need to be with the people who accept me for who I am. If I fit in, I have to be like you, but if I belong, I can be who I am. When that is thwarted, that increases the risk for suicide. And so that is why on school campuses and in college campuses, we work a lot on 
what are the different factors that increase a sense of belonging and connection among diverse cultural communities on school campuses and college campuses. The second piece of the interpersonal theory is something called perceived burdensomeness. Very long word, but when you feel like a burden to others, it's a problem. We, we all feel like burdens to others at times, but for someone who is in a state of thinking about taking their life or self-harm, feeling like a burden is something we have to address directly because a heightened sense of that, feeling like a burden, it, it's a perception because those people don't feel like you're a burden, but the depressed person who is overwhelmed may feel like they're a burden. And so helping peers show up for their friends, giving them words that they can use, the language to use, giving teachers the language and the phrases to use to show care and concern can be very important. These are simple interventions, but what we need are administrators and school boards who make room for this. How many of you know there's a state law that requires that we teach about suicide prevention and well-being in public schools in California? Okay, a few of you. So. AB 1767 and 2246, which became the pupil suicide prevention policies which were passed into law, are what tell us in schools that actually we need to do this. When you have a health curriculum, we're actually required in grades 7 through 12, but I would say we actually need this from K through 6. So AB 1767 was passed to address the younger students' needs. Because elementary educators are saying, what about us? We are seeing earlier and earlier presentations of severe distress in young people and even suicidal presentations in elementary school. So this is why in California, you're probably all or most of you are from California except for the speakers. You may not have known this, but we are living in a bubble. In the nine Bay Area counties, we are living in a bubble. I mean, yes, there are challenges here and there are struggles with administration and policy and things that don't get done, but we got it way better than a lot of other folks. We have to take advantage of these opportunities we have to have the conversations in our classrooms and in our communities. So I wanna move next to the media because the media is part of the solution. Unfortunately, they're also part of the problem. So in our two clusters in Palo Alto, we experienced a youth and an adult suicide in our community and outside our community the day before we started our cluster. And the deaths were reported on the front page and the next day we started our cluster. There were two Viennese studies from Vienna, Austria, from the 80s that looked at suicide contagion and found that, I mean, they were losing people in the 80s like every two weeks there was a death in front of the train tracks. The Viennese media got together, because they lost dozens of people in one city in a period of about a year, 12 to 18 months, and they're losing people every few weeks. They decided, we are just gonna stop covering this. We are, no, we are not going to cover this anymore, full stop. Full stop is European for period. You got that right. <laughs> so. Full stop, we're not going to cover them. Um, but this was in Vienna, so they didn't say it with that British accent. But there were two studies that were really big that kind of informed all the work that came after. And they were based on the work that was happening in the 80s, but they were published in the 90s. And it, they basically found that just more sensible, less dramatic, no headline coverage with leaving out the specifics and not talking about where it happened and really talking about the person and their life rather than focusing on the death, um, nearly eliminated the suicide deaths. And they dropped by 80% in the six months following initiation of this organized campaign that the journalists had to encourage safe media reporting. And these were published in evidence-based journals, social science and medicine, and archives of suicide research. And in fact, that has been the basis of the work that we are doing now. And you'll hear from Vicki Harrison, who is Vicki in the audience, um, from the Center for Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing, and um, the work that's going on with the Tempos tool. And I think they have a breakout group this afternoon. All right, um, so we have 
five minutes. Did you just show me Elmo? Oh, you showed me Elmo five minutes ago. All right. So I'm going to give you um, two more slides, and then we're going to stop. And then I'm going to continue the discussion in, um, I'm doing a breakout on medications. OK. We're going to have a break, and then we're going to have breakout rooms. And I'm going to ask Lori to come up to do a little bit of housekeeping about what we do after this. So very quickly, depression facts in young people. Before our young people walk across that stage and get that diploma, one in five will have struggled with depression of some sort. Okay, Maybe not major depressive disorder, but some kind of depressive condition that knocked them out of their life for a week or two. 10 to 15% of our young people have symptoms at any one time. Symptoms. Um, average age is around sophomore year, around 15. And those who take their life and die by suicide have had a mental health condition, a psychiatric disorder at the time of their death, and typically symptoms for at least a year. The problem in youth is that the signs may not be as obvious, particularly in boys, because we're just not acculturated to talk about our feelings, which is why everyone needs to buy Dr. Brackett's book and download the app to learn about feelings and learn how to talk and express about them. And of course, depression and anxiety rates rose during the pandemic, no surprise there. Um, and so we always have to think about culture in everything we do, every interaction. So I raise future pediatricians and psychiatrists. That's what I do in one of my jobs at Stanford. I've been a program director for 25 years. And as I said, I have a charmed academic life because I'm surrounded by beautiful, smart people with lots of ideas and tough questions. So a tough question has to do with this idea that we live in a very diverse place in the nine Bay Area counties. It's not a one-size-fits-all, but there are some universal truths. There is a human brain with biology that we've learned from. We know that genetics play a role. We know mood disorders run in families across cultures. We know that neurotransmitter imbalance is a thing. It may not be the holy grail, but we know that there is some truth to the idea that when you do talk therapy before and after and you look at 12 weeks and you look at PET scans, which may measure blood flow, in certain areas of the brain after talk therapy, you see changes in the brain and the areas affected by depression, similar to what you see with medicine. And if you combine talk therapy with medicine, like CBT for depression with SSRI medicines like fluoxetine, Prozac, or escitalopram, Lexapro, you actually see even more dramatic changes. So we know that the brain has a very important role to play. That's the biology, that's the green circle here. On the left, you've heard this morning about how thought patterns and coping skills are very important for young people because they're learning how to live their life. It's not, this is one crisis, it's gonna stop and they're gonna move on with their life and there'll be another one. So how do we do therapy that is skills-based in addition to helps them understand their feelings? So the next time something comes up, they can actually accept and understand because their brains aren't fully developed yet, but they can learn the skills. The social piece I just talked about on the last slide around family, school, and peer factors that some of which we took for granted before the pandemic, but afterwards we understood how important connection is, not only virtually, but especially in person. And then culture. So, and then culture is not best for last. It's on top of everything. These are all transparent, but culture is, we all have a culture. You have a culture around your kitchen table. You have a culture if you're part of the AIM Youth Ambassadors. You have a culture depending on what kind of job you do. And it has to do with how much does your culture encourage you to look at mental health as part of overall health. If you are struggling with fitting in or a sense of belonging, is that something that is talked about on your kitchen table or in your school or in your place of work? And, and we need to learn about and be curious about each other's beliefs and values and traditions and norms. In my work at the university, where you know we have a very diverse group of students, we have lots of religious holidays, we have faculty who are stuck in their ways and who start to kind of roll their eyes and say, oh God, another religious holiday. That was not a pun, by the way. Oh God, another religious holiday. But it, you know, it's the idea of you know, respect and, and strength and diversity. And you know, I love my faculty, most of them get that. But 
they struggle with, you know, well, how are we supposed to keep it by rigor if the student's not coming for so many days? Oh, but there's ways to do that. We've been doing that for years. But what is this about, really? What is this cranky faculties issue really about? Well, that's where the relationship comes back in. You know, it all starts with Dr. Brackett's work. It's like, well, I need to have a conversation with that faculty to just understand what is going on that they're having such a reaction to students needing time away for religious holidays. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause right now because we are out of time. And my very last slide is an orienting colleagues to culturally effective care. So you'll hear terms like cultural competence. You'll hear terms like culturally informed care. At the end of the day, we have to be effective with our work. So we invite our colleagues to consider culture in every interaction with clients or patients or students and to begin with an attitude of humility and self-reflection. Knowing yourself first, knowing who your people are, what your values are important before you go in the room with another person. Appreciate the complexities that every interaction brings. So knowing when we don't know rather than making assumptions, knowing about our biases and prejudices, many of them are unintentional, and knowing when to get a cultural consultation. And that means like asking young people to help us out when we're not sure if we have a question about something.